Welcome to London Futurists, where our usual mission statement is that we are looking seriously at possible radical scenarios for the next, we say, three to 40 years. Normally we say we don't look at things that might happen in the next year or two because so many other groups are looking at these developments. So we don't speculate what's going to be in the next release of the iPhone, for example. Instead, we say we're looking at potential larger changes further afield. But with quantum computing, it's hard to know. It is such a difficult thing to get our heads round, and the potential implications of it really are hard to weigh up. So in this case, the mission statement may be wrong. It is possible that once people see what the first successful quantum computers can do, things might actually change even more quickly than three years. I don't know. Or it might be a longer time. To help us make our minds up about that, we are very fortunate today. We have a speaker, Peter Morgan, who has studied lots of different aspects of quantum mechanics, both as a physicist, he might mention some of his background <coughs> doing theoretical physics, but also as somebody working in the field of artificial intelligence and with uh, quantum computing and from a business perspective. So he's going to guide us through some of the past, some of the present day, and lead us into a discussion as to what we might expect maybe in the next three years, certainly in the next 40 years, the ways in which technology may change, and as a result, some of the biggest issues about human living may turn out to be easier to solve than we previously thought. So let's welcome Peter Morgan. David, yeah. Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for the introduction, David. So as David mentioned, uh, just in case you didn't um, read my LinkedIn profile, I uh, did a, I was doing a PhD at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst uh, in theoretical particle physics. Uh, so that kind of gives me a good, um, you know, uh, credibility, if you like, uh, to understand quantum computing. Well, the quantum part of quantum computing. Uh, and then, as David said, I've uh, been working in AI for like the last six years. Um, but before that, I was a system engineer for companies like Cisco and IBM, BT Labs. So that, that's, the quant that's the computing part for 20 years. So I did the quantum for 20 and the computing for 20. So if you put those together, maybe, just maybe, I have some sort of, um, you know, credibility or whatever to actually speak to you today about quantum computing. Okay. Um, so the first thing I want to get out the way is that there's this, um, okay, so big, uh, the bigger picture, a bit of a step back before I launch, launch into all the technical details and the math. Um, so quantum computing is here now. Uh, it's not in the future, it's here. Uh, we're going to see a lot of changes. Uh, so hang on to your seats. We just saw quite a few recently. I don't know if you've been keeping up with the news, but I'm going to cover those. That's the first thing I'm going to cover. Very, very exciting times. Uh, there's loads of conferences, both academic, but then it brings me to this. Um, so there's a quantum computing uh, business um, conference in Twickenham in April. Right. So it's run by uh, quantum.tech. They, they, they also have AI conferences, financial, all sorts of different conferences. So it's, it's, it's mainstream, right? I mean, there's a business conference in Twickenham, you know, the home of rugby, big you know, conference center in a few months, right? If, if that's not mainstream, I'm not sure what is. Um, there's been a f quite a few in the States recently, some in Europe. This is the first big one in, in, in the UK and London. Um, so yeah, no, it's definitely mainstream already. I mean, it m might not feel like it to you guys, but in the industry where I am, it is it's totally like two years ago when I sort of started, I made a decision I wanted to do quantum computing. There wasn't that much going on, but in the last two years, I've seen a lot happening um, to the point where we've just reached quantum supremacy, and I'll talk about that next. Okay, so, um, you know, I don't want to, I'm not here to promote this and get you to spend a thousand pound on a conference, but I mean, if you had a thousand pound, it might be a good conference to go to. Okay, so um, let's, uh, that's what I'm going to be doing today. Let's start with the news, then I'll, um, which I just mentioned, then. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a nice gentle introduction today, okay? It, it's, I, I said math, that was a bit of a joke. It's just going to be a nice gentle overview, little history, little background, you know, what, what, what is quantum hardware, what's a qubit, what's software, what does so quantum software look like, you know, what is it, is it like classical software, is it completely different, what's the math look like? Uh, and then, for the second half of the talk, I'm going to focus on applica an application of quantum computing. Uh, which is simulating chemistry, which is what Richard Feynman said the use would be back in 1981 for quantum computers. So that's going to help us uh, speed up drug discovery, all sorts of uh, good stuff, amazing, weird, and wonderful things. And then, at the very, because this is London Futurists, I'm allowed to speculate, right? David mentions three to 40 years. I mean, who the hell knows what's going to be happening in five years? I mean, you know, anything. So I'm going to go into the grand challenges. Can quantum computing help us solve drug discovery, uh, longevity, helping us live longer. David's written a book about that. Uh, energy, climate change. Can we use quantum computers to solve climate change? People are actually doing that right now as we speak in this theater, okay? Uh, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. So here we go. Um, what's been happening? Right, okay. So did we all hear about the uh, quantum supremacy announcement from Google? Did we all hear? Yeah? Yeah, okay, so that's big news. That's a big, that's, a, that's like landing on the moon times 10 for me. That's a big, big moment. Um, people are claiming it wasn't, you know, everyone's trying to downplay it, but it was. <laughs> that's huge, okay? Uh, Google managed to perform a calculation on a quantum computer uh, that would take 100,000 years on a classical computer in about 2.5 minutes. Right, okay, so already, this is what quantum supremacy means. Uh, John Prescott at Caltech and a few years ago said there'll be a moment where uh, quantum compute, we can do so, uh, something, some computation on a, a quantum computer that would take us 100,000, a million, the life of the universe to do on a classical computer. Google did that two weeks ago. Okay, so we're there. We passed that milestone. That, that was huge. IBM, almost at the same time, uh, announced they're releasing their 53 qubit machine on the cloud. So you and I today can log in there as long as we've got some money. Uh, you can use, we can use their free one, which is five qubits. You have to pay for the 20 qubit, 53 qubit. Remember, quantum computing goes exponentially. It's not linear in qubits, so it's two to the 53, which is more than the biggest Intel processor, AMD, NVIDIA. Pick your favorite hardware manufacturer, right? Uh, so, yeah, that's huge. That's another huge announcement right there. Uh, before that, the biggest uh, uh, quantum computer available to the public, like you and I, was 20 qubits, 2 to the 20. 2 to the 53 exponential curve is just massively uh, bigger than that. Finally, just about a week ago, uh, Microsoft announced that they're going to, uh, because they're trying a harder type of quantum computing, it's going to take them longer, so they didn't want to miss out. They said, okay, we're going to, we're going to, um, for you release or offer three different quantum computing hardware vendors in, in, in Azure, in our cloud. So, so you can't get much more mainstream than Azure, right? Right. Okay. And th those, uh, th you may not have heard it, Honeywell, INQ, and Quantum Circuits. So Honeywell's a multinational, and the other two are startups based in the US, on the East Coast in the United States. And so it's, it's there, right? It's on the cloud. There's 53 qubits and quantum supremacy. So I'm, I'm here to say the future's already happened a few weeks ago, right? These are, these are big announcements. Right? You can't, can't underestimate any of that. So on the cover of Nature, quantum supremacy, you know, is a big deal. Google's been, you know, hinting, suggesting, teasing. Teasing is the right word for a few months now that, you know, they're going to announce, have an announcement about quantum supremacy. Well, they finally did it about a month ago. They said to the world, uh, and it went straight on the cover of Nature, it caused a huge, you know, thing in the quantum community, quantum computer community, although we expected it. It was sort of a big deal. Uh, everyone tried to pick holes in it. Is it real? Is it not? Did they cheat? They didn't cheat. It's real, right? That's a big deal, what they did, it actually. It's very impressive. Um, IBM were trying to get there first. They didn't, so uh, the day after, they wrote a paper saying oh, it wasn't really quantum supremacy. You know, we could have done that on our on a on a summit super classical supercomputer in three days. It's like so what? They did it in two minutes, right? So IBM got a bit sour grapes, but this is this is huge by Google. That Google won. <laughs> okay, so and then we have the uh, Microsoft in the cloud. 
uh, announcement, and then, which I just said, but then this is the IBM 53 qubit. IBM did very well. They didn't get supremacy first, but they have a 53 qubit. Google haven't got anything in the cloud yet. It's still in their lab. We can log into that. Again, if we have money, it costs a lot of money uh, because they're so powerful and you can do so much in a microsecond. They, they do cost things like, you know, $1,000 a minute, but you can do a lot <laughs> in that <What>? minute. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe solve cancer or something like that, <laughs> right? I mean, you try and hire, you know, the whole, su the biggest supercomputer in the world, that's going to cost you $1,000 a minute, right? So it's the same. They're about the same at the moment, just to, you know. So, and there it is, there's the architecture. That's a 53 qubit, uh, that's an amazing thing, right? That's a 53 qubit, and I'll explain what a qubit is in a minute. This is just a news section. Um, uh, <laughs> quantum processor. So there they are, that's how they're connected. They're not, they're not all to all, right? Well, how did they come up with that architecture? We'd have to ask the uh, uh, IBM uh, researchers at IBM Research, okay? But that's what they did. Uh, and they have various architectures for their 20-qubit chip, their 5-qubit processor. Now they have uh, 10. They have 10 quantum computers in the cloud. So IBM are way out in front. Microsoft and Google have not got any in the cloud. Uh, IBM have 10 quantum computers now that we can log into today in the cloud. Right? I'm not sure if anyone knew that. So what is quantum computing? So that's the news, right? That's bringing you up to date, right? The future happened a few weeks ago. Now we're here. So what the hell is quantum computing? What, what is it, right? So uh, as I mentioned, in 1981, Feynman at Caltech, we all know Richard Feynman, right? Everyone's favorite physicist. Uh, he was very good. I'd put uh, Einstein, Newton, and Feynman in the same bracket. Very, very clever guy. Uh, actually uh, came up with quantum field theory, which I studied in my PhD and got the Nobel Prize for that, along with Schringer and Tomanaga. So he, in 1981, said, you know what? Uh, to, to understand nature, chemistry, molecular at the molecular level, we're going to need uh, quantum computers. They will do it, right? And everyone said, what the hell's he on about? Uh, but it's Feynman, so he could see further. And it turns out that uh, a quantum computer can uh, simulate nature exactly. It's the same thing, right? If you running, if you have, say, NH3 ammonia molecule, you can simulate that perfectly on that uh, 53 qubit thing. You just need the uh, same number of qubits as you have molecules, or, or uh, it's to do with the electronic structure. So Feynman saw that quickly and very clearly in 1981, before anybody had really even started, there wasn't even much theory about quantum computing. It was pretty sci-fi actually back then, right? Certainly no one had started building them. IBM labs were the first people to do that in the 80s, but he sort of probably prompted them to even consider looking at that. So that, that's where it all started, really. It's not that old. It's a new technology. He said, nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical. And by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. Right? So Feynman, <laughs> 40 years later, <laughs> it's like, yeah, 53 qubits, uh, quantum supremacy. So it's a hard problem, right? There's been very clever people working on this for 40 years. And Feynman liked hard problems, like uh, most good physicists do. So let's have a quick history. So 1984, uh, sorry, 94, this was the um, conference, uh, you know, just a handful of physicists at this conference. There, there no computer science. It was just a physics problem, right? Almost a theoretical physics problem. So these guys are very clever people. Charles Bennett worked at IBM Labs back then. I think he still does. He's kind of in semi-retirement. But as we all know, you know, good physicists can't retire, right? Because there's always some other problem to solve. So he's about 80, but he still work, goes into work. I think every day he brings his lunchbox into IBM Labs in Yorktown, right? So he's probably 40 back then, or, thir or 50. And, um, you know, he sort of guides, you know, the younger guys as PhDs coming through. And, and you can actually take a PhD in quantum computing today at some good universities, like, yeah. You know, you can, Oxford, UCL, um, Princeton, U MIT, Caltech, right? Uh, you know, 10 years ago, you probably couldn't. It was, you did math, you did physics, or you did computer science, right? And, and no one put them all together. But with, that's the great thing about quantum computer. We, you, you need to put everything together. You need to be really good at computer science. You have to be quite good at math, and you have to be very good at quantum physics. So there are new, you know, undergraduate and graduate uh, level uh, courses and degrees now 
uh, specifically addressing quantum computing because it's a thing. And, and the industry can't get enough people, quantum computing people, right? Google, IBM, Microsoft would hire 100 people if they could find 100 PhDs in quantum. You can't find those people. They have everyone already. And there's about, I don't know, you know, their teams are about maybe between 20 and 50 PhD, not that many, okay? So it's a rare, it's a rare skill. Uh, people are training up, um, but it's gonna take a little while. Okay, so that, that, that's 1994. This is this year. This is Quip Quantum Information Processing Conference, which is one of the uh, uh, important quantum computing conferences, quantum information. So there's maybe, you know, a few hundred people in the room. So we've gone from a few dozen to a few hundred, ramping up. But I think all this sort of goes away when, when, when with the announcement of quantum supremacy. That, that was a big announcement. We, we've kind of done. We've passed a huge milestone. Okay, but that, uh, just to give you a feel, I'm trying to convince you here. Do you feel convinced that quantum computing is a thing? And it's not just, it might be a thing. It is a thing, right? Okay, so more people. Uh, you can go look all these people up here. There's John Martinez. He's heading up the Google uh, effort. And uh, John Preskill, he's the main guy at Caltech at the moment. He started, he was a particle physicist when I was doing my PhD. Shows how old I am. But um, 20 years ago, he switched into quantum information theory because uh, he saw the future. He's bright. He actually holds the Richmond Feynman chair at Caltech. He's a very smart guy. So the, the, these are very well-known people in the industry. David Deutsch at Oxford, he's a great theorist. Uh, he actually wrote the first paper on quantum computing and said it was possible. Okay, David Doig, I'll definitely check him out. He, he's written some great books, A Road to Infinity. He, he's a great thinker, right? He's a huge, huge thinker. So he's there, Richard Feynman. Uh, David Wineland did something with uh, Josephson Junctions, uh, super, superconducting qubits um, back in the 90s, I think. Even He got the Nobel Prize for experimental physics. Uh, so all of these people are super well known in the field. Kitiev's at Caltech, he's, he's a brilliant theoretician. Aram Harrow is a young guy at MIT, like a superstar in theory, information theory. There's Charlie Bennett at IBM. Lov Grovner was at AT&T Bell Labs. Came up with Grosvenor theorem. So, so what do we run on these quantum computers? We run quantum algorithms, right? So he came up with one of the first. Uh, Pete Shaw came up, well, he's not on here. Pete Shaw came up with um, uh, factorization, factorizing large numbers. Grover came up with a search, so we can we can do factorization on a quantum computer, and that's why everyone's getting very worried about encryption. Like ah, all the banks like ah. So our, now we have quantum supremacy, 53 qubit in the cloud. What's to stop a malicious actor, a hacker, logging in there and basically you know breaking all our encryption? Yeah, so so it's a huge problem, uh, and so that was Pete Shaw with the factorization. And Lov Grovner did search, so we can use quantum computers to search. We can use the algorithm. Now, all these algorithms have, you know, complexity theory. If you've ever done computer science and, and theorems and p equals mp, they have their equivalent to all the classical work. Mathematically, there's a whole branch called uh, theoretical uh, quantum complexity theory, which is a mathematical branch, which basically tells us what to expect from quantum algorithms, what's possible, what's not, but they're the things that are, we're going to run on quantum computers. Now, that's all a bit technical, but I saw this guy's name and I couldn't resist. <laughs> yeah. So he was at Bell Labs back in the 90s, Pete Shaw was at MIT back in the 90s. So a lot of the theoretical work was done, you know, sort of started in the 90s, about 10 years after Feynman. So this thing, there's Chris Munro, he's uh, INQ, they've just raised $100 million at, um, I think, Maryland, uh, to build a quantum computer. So he's been in the field about 30 years. Okay, so that guy's been working slowly, 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 exponential, exponential. It's the hare and the tortoise, right? So these, you know, he's finally, it's paid, paid off for him. He's just stayed there. He didn't give up and go, ah, this is too hard. So INQ have built a quantum computer. Um, built out of trapped ions with about uh, 20, something like that, okay? But it's expert, they'll, they'll have 40 next year, then 80, and then blah, blah, blah. Okay, so all these guys very well, I just looked them up, and that's a good place to start, I think. Looking at the people, that's where I like to start, anyway. And the work, it's, it's rather than dive into papers or reading the press, which can be a bit hype or doom and gloom, whatever, just look at the guys who actually did the work, right? Okay, so, yeah, what's the qubit? Um, What's the difference between classical computing and quantum computing? Uh, so quantum computing uses the laws of quantum mechanics, as David mentioned, quantum physics, okay? And um, classical physics is different from quantum physics. 
and quantum physics is different from classical physics. So if you don't do a physical physics uh, degree or anything and study quantum mechanics, uh, Newton right, came up with all the laws of classical physics back in the 1600s. In the 1900s, early 1900s, Schrodinger, Planck, uh, uh, Dirac, um, uh, Pauli, these are names you've probably, uh, Heisenberg, um, these are names you've probably heard of, uh, discovered that nature doesn't obey classical uh, physics laws. Okay, it's very small, it does, everything breaks down, right? It, it just doesn't work. Newton's laws work for big things. <laughs> For small things the size of atoms, it doesn't work. It just does not work. It's not the correct description of nature, right? So quantum mechanics is fundamentally different from classical, right? There's just two different worlds, okay? We live in the classical world. This is, this is what we see. We bounce a ball and we can, you know, the f laws of Newton's equations, F equals MA, we can calculate its trajectory exactly, the planets around the sun. Uh, when it comes to an electron around a nucleus in an atom, uh, classical physics predicts it will decay straight away in a nanosecond or something. Quantum mechanics, so we needed a new description of nature. Why doesn't the electron just uh, collapse into this positive uh, center in the atoms in the world? I mean, the universe wouldn't be here. It would come into existence and a nanosecond later it wouldn't be here or something like that. Um, so we just had to say, okay, nature isn't classical, damn it, right? It's, it's something else going on here. So Schrodinger, very clever guys, Pauli, Planck, they, they, they just said, okay, this is what we observe experimentally, black body radiation, um, you know, the uh, wavelength uh, of light is quantized uh, from atoms and molecules. So they just wrote down equations to describe that. They didn't understand it. They just said it doesn't obey F equals MA anymore. It, it actually uh, obeys Schrodinger's equation. Right? So it's different. And they all got Nobel Prizes and it worked. And it's the most accurate measurement ever done to seven or eight decimal places is a quantum mechanical measurement, alpha the fine structure constant to do with the uh, splitting of the energy levels of electrons and atoms and stuff. So we, we, we understand, we can write down the equation, it doesn't mean we understand what quantum mechanics is. In fact, Feynman said, if someone tells you they understand quantum mechanics, they're lying, right? I, no one knows, why, why, why should that be? You know, it's just different and uh, classical. So we, at some level, we have to accept this just works. Okay? So when I say, you know, what's a qubit? So I can tell you what a qubit does, but it doesn't mean anyone understands what a qubit, why, why a qubit behaves how it does, right? And that's fair enough, right? Uh, in physics, we always say why is the wrong question. We're just interested in how. We leave why to the philosophers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, a, a qubit then, well, a bit, we all know bits uh, on, off, up, down, uh, you know, transistors can be on or off. With quantum, uh, they can be in an infinite number of states. Uh, a quantum state can be infinite, and um, it's represented mathematically on something called a block sphere, or, or you can just imagine this arrow being a quantum state. It can be anywhere in three dimensional space. And um, the phone ring. Uh, <laughs> and that's probably the best I can do, really. And that, that's all that I anybody does. That's just, we, we just say that, and then we move on and do the math and start building stuff in labs, right? So uh, if you don't understand what a qubit, and somebody asks you what's a qubit, don't worry if you can't un explain it. No one else can. Uh, you, you can, you know, just say, well, it, it's uh, like a vector on a block sphere, right? That's what this is called, a block sphere, B-L-O-C-H, right? And... Uh, so this vector can take uh, an, infinite, an infinite number of points on that block sphere, uh, and a measurement will put that vector into a certain state, right? And that's probably the best we can do. Whereas the classical bit, it's either on or off, um, and, and that's nice and easy, you know, but why, why should a, a quantum world have an infinite number of um, directions? Well, why not? Okay. So... And that's why the math looks a bit messy, so we write, write it down. Uh, so that's, we had a, uh, digital's easy, classical's easy, right? It's the state's one or zero, we don't have to do much. But uh, if you're trying to represent an infinite number of states with a vector, so, so that vector could be up or down, uh, quantum could be anywhere. This is how we do it, that's a very general equation for a vector which can point in any direction on a block sphere. And I think that's enough for the math, okay? I won't, won't do any more math. But, you know, this stuff's been known since the 20s, 1920s, Schrodinger equation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
and, and, and it's very well understood. Uh, we just don't know why nature behaves, but why should we know why, right? Okay, and so the, the weird stuff that comes out of all of this is three different things. Superposition, it means that uh, atoms can be in the same place or electrons, um, quantum matter can occupy the same physical uh, space at the same time, <laughs> right? How counterintuitive is that? How can two basketballs occupy? They can't. In the classical world, that's impossible. But in the quantum world, it, it, it happens all the time. So there's superposition. Entanglement means that action at a distance, what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. So if we have um, an electron over this side of the universe and one over this side of the universe, well, uh, sorry, they're, they're together and one travels way over there, and we uh, the other side of the universe, and we measure this electron on this, uh, uh, place, uh, it, we instantly know what that electron's doing. So, so that, that's instantaneous transmission of information, or it seems like it, but it's not. All we do is we know the state, it doesn't mean that any information's traveled between the two, which is a bit of a resolution of that Einstein's dilemma, spooky action at a distance. How can that be? Nothing travels faster than the speed of light, you know, uh, special theory of relativity, everything, you know, I'm not throwing uh, physics out the window, said Einstein, sitting at Princeton in the 1950s, right? And all the quantum guys said, well, you, we, you have to. Uh, we, we don't care. <laughs> we don't care that you're Einstein, right? It's, you know, we, we listen to nature, not, not, not you. Okay, so Einstein, brilliant guy, but refused, in some sense, to, to ever accept quantum mechanics. Yeah, which is a bit, a bit strange, really. Um, anyway, this is, how, this is how it works, okay? despite what Einstein thought or wanted or wished, uh, it doesn't work. It works like quantum mechanics, works like nature works. Um, and actually Einstein spent the rest of his life after 1915 with general relativity, he spent 40 years trying to unify uh, classical and, and quantum and he couldn't do it. Yeah. No one's done it yet either. <laughs> it's a hard problem. That doesn't change the fact that these are real phenomena and, and they never change. Um, and then the last thing is quantum tunneling uh, that means that if we have a wall or a barrier, an electron on this side can uh, tunnel over and be on the other side as well. And classically, if, if I throw a ball at a wall, no matter how hard, and if I break the wall, it's never going to end. There's no probability. The probability that it always bounces back is one. In quantum mechanics, if I hurl an electron at a barrier, uh, there's some probability that it will tunnel through that barrier. Okay. And this is all explained in the Schrodinger equation, the Dirac equation. Okay. So we've, we, we, we've done the math. We've, we, we've done a, a zillion experiments. And it, nature always acts like this. And so this is how qubits act, is why I'm spending so much time, okay? This is how the quantum world acts. Right, okay. So that's it. That's the theory and the background. Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me why. <laughs> yeah, a, a few of them. So when, when you talk about entanglement of information, yeah. is, it, is, is it just inst instant information that is coming from place A to place B mm. almost at the exact same speed of time. Yeah, so what it is, we, it's just to do with measurement. And you find everything quantum mechanic has to do with measurement. If we don't measure anything, we, you know, we just, it can be doing what it can be doing, a dance, it can do what it wants, it can be red or yellow. But as soon as you measure a quantum state, it puts it into a specific state, okay? That's what entanglement means. If I measure, once I measure a state of an electron, I know the state of the other electron no matter if it's right next to it or, or, or uh, an infinite number of miles away. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is weird, right? How does that work? It, it just does. That's, that's how nature works, right? Fundamentally how nature works. Yeah. You talked about shooting electrons through a barrier. What, what kind of barrier would that be that's impenetrable <coughs> to it, Yeah, it could be an electric field, for example. It can be anything, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Any, any molecular level barrier you want. Yeah, anything. Right. The point is that it's not um, <coughs> when you drill down, right, you get a brick and you drill it. It's made of atoms, right, and molecules. And so it's not solid as such. Um, so what happens really, uh, maybe I should have mentioned this, um, an electron or a molecule, it's, it's described by a wave function. So it's not a point anymore or, 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 or a, a sort of solid object in space. It's actually a wave. It's, it has a probability distribution that it will be there in some point in space. So if you look at things that way, it's kind of obvious that if I you know, uh, send an electron through a, a particle accelerator maybe or some sort of uh, nuclear decay or something uh, through um, 
a, a screen, if you like, of atoms, it's not a solid screen anymore. It's a it has a probability of uh, atoms have a probability. So it's no surprise, really, it can, it can go through. So my, my like suggestion that? at this stage is that getting our heads around how the quantum world works yeah. is very hard indeed. Yeah. And as you heard from Peter, Richard Feynman said, anybody who thinks they understand it probably doesn't. Yeah. So, but the point that Feynman and Deutsch both made is, David Deutsch both made, is that if we take this seriously, then we should be able to put bits of hardware into various states, which maybe we didn't expect before, which allow us to calculate things which previously nobody had thought was possible. Yeah. So I'd love to talk about the meaning of quantum mechanics. It's a fascinating subject. It's got deep philosophical ramifications. But I fear if we do that, we're yeah. never going to get on to the exactly. tangible stuff of quantum mechanics, so, uh, of quantum computing. So I'm yeah. happy to talk to anybody about the meaning of quantum mechanics in the pub afterwards. Oh, and by the way, I'm a many-worlder, if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, probably, yeah, conversation best left over in the pub. Okay, so let's get into the more concrete uh, part now. So we've, we've seen that it's mysterious, we can just, if we can accept that, then we can move on, and we do, and people win Nobel Prizes for building hardware these days, quantum hardware. Um, so the point is that there's many types of uh, ways that these um, uh, that nature can put things in quantum states, okay? It can use um, uh, superconducting is the most common. That's Google uh, quantum supremacy breakthrough. They use superconducting material uh, or superconducting qubits. Uh, photon we can use photons. We can use trapped ions. I mentioned them, which is an ion is just an atom with an electron stripped off. It's very straightforward, really. But it's building these things, which is an engineering problem, which is very hard, right? So putting 30 trapped ions in a, in a containment so they don't decohere is a very, very hard problem, which is why it's taken 40 years to get to quantum supremacy from 1981. We've got quantum dots, a different type of hard uh, uh, matter w w which can occupy um, different quantum states. So the idea with the qubit is that you can put a, a certain type of matter in, a different, in two different states and measure it, and then that will give you the actual, uh, the measurement will give you the result of the computation you're trying to do if you put the right quantum algorithm in. Quantum computer, quantum algorithm in, measurement, and you get a result. And, and that's what it is. And you can do that in different ways on different types of hardware. And here is the hardware. Uh, so Google, IBM, D-Wave. Uh, anyone heard of D-Wave? They're based in Canada. Yep. Uh, uh, Rigetti, based in, San Fr in, in on the uh, West Coast. San Francisco, Xanadu in Toronto, Intel, and INQ, based on the East Coast of the US. So these, these are companies that have all built uh, quantum processors, right? Some have only got two qubits, some have got four. Uh, you know, I just mentioned IBM have just announced 53. Last year they had 20, you know, so the, the number, it's like, they, they, it's on their own Moore's Law, quantum, uh, the number of qubits doubles every two years. It's called uh, Nevin's Law, right? So there's, there's, a, there's a Moore's Law for quantum. In fact, it may be uh, double exponential. It could be doubling doubling every two years because of the weird properties of quantum mechanics. So this could happen much quicker than the, uh, classical computing. So if you're thinking, oh, it's 53 qubits, so what? Uh, it won't just go 53, 50, 100, 200. It goes 50, 200, 800, 3200, double, double. Yeah, double exponential. That's, that's Nevin's law. So Nevin works at Google with, with Martin. And so um, the point is, uh, we're, we're at the beginning of that exponential, and it could be quite a steep one. We, we, that's the thing we don't know, okay? As futurists, we don't know. Even IBM and Google don't know. They d don't know. So far, they've got to 50, uh, and it's followed this nice exponential since the 90s. Beautiful exponential. One, two, four, uh, 53, yeah? Rigetti thinks I'll have 128 next year. Um, we don't know. See, we don't understand the laws of physics well enough, quantum physics, to definitely predict that this Nevin's law will hold. I'm not sure if Gordon Moore knew if law, Moore's law is going to hold either. Or if you just like, this is an experimental observation. So that's kind of how we are now, okay? So that's being London Futurist, that's the one thing we don't know, whether they'll keep doubling, 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 or is there something in the laws of physics? And some people have said, they've written papers about this saying, uh, by the way, we can't get higher than 100 qubits. Right? Uh, and they're very few, like less than 1% of the physics community is thinking along those lines. 
but it, it could be true. We could be just 53 and that's it. Right? It's that because be of engineering issues rather than physics issues, isn't it? No, no, it's actually a fundamental physics issue as well. Some people have written papers and, you know, that f anyone can write anything in physics is fine. It's an experimental subject, right? We have to test, but um, we don't know. And, and uh, you know, it'd be a hell of a shame if we just stopped now. Yeah, it would really suck, actually. But here we are, yeah, 2019. <laughs> Going into 2020, three huge announcements and uh, everything's looking good. But I'm not going to stand here and tell you it's just going to keep going on forever. I wish I could, but I can't. Okay. But in the meantime, there's hundreds of millions, billions even in the case of Google, Microsoft, IBM, going into the matter of fact, that's not, one paper is not going to stop anybody doing anything, right? We're crazy. We're scientists. We, we just love, we're curious. We're going to keep going no matter what and see what happens. Meanwhile, the theorists are all busy trying to, you know, say, no, no, we can, it can go on. You know, we can have a million qubits, the laws of physics, entanglement, superposition. Uh, there's nothing there that says we can't build it theoretically, right? But no one's proven it. There's no theorem out there yet that proves that. And there's some pretty clever, you know, guys uh, working on this, trust me. Okay, quite mathematical at that level. These are, these are more guys. Uh, QCI, that's the one that... Uh, Microsoft has just put on the cloud, putting on the cloud. We can't log in today, but it'll be there soon. PsiQuantum, okay, interesting backstory. They were uh, from Bristol and uh, Imperial. A couple of professors couldn't raise the venture capital they needed in London, so they, they thought they had to go to San Francisco, Silicon Valley, and raise VC out there, and they did. And so they're based in San Francisco, whereas they could have been a UK, mm. sort of UK, you know, huge story in quantum. We, 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 we lost them. They, they've gone, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, so Baidu are building them. Uh, Atom uh, Computing on the West Coast. Raytheon are multinational. So the startup multinational. Um, startups are quite brave, right? Because to, to build a quantum computer, you need at least 100 million. Right, that, that's just state money, table money, right? Uh, you need to hire a team of about 50 engineers, uh, mathematicians, physicists, because it's sort of, sort of science experiment. And they all got to be PhDs and postdocs and professors. Uh, it's it's not cheap. It's not just one or two guys on their Mac laptop sitting in a room building an app, right? It's, you have to have <laughs> uh, huge fabs and, and cryogenics to cool these things down. It's a big, big story, right? So these uh, little guys are pretty, pretty impressive, if you ask me. Some of them are spinning out of universities, college professors, so they have a lot of kudos, right? So they can kind of raise thirty million or something like that. Um, but yeah, it'd be hard for you and I to say, you know what, Mr. Investor, I'm going to start a uh, quantum computing company. I'm going to build some qubits and this technology, and uh, you know, I need 50 million. Uh, um, who are you, actually? No, you're not a professor from you know Yale or um, Imperial. So no, go away. <laughs> so this is this is the state where we're at. You either have to be a multinational or, or, or so you know a physics professor, basically. Um, Oxford Quantum Computer, Peter Leake in Oxford, Quantum Motion, John Morton here at UCL, Alpine Quantum Technologies in uh, Austria, group of uh, professors in Silicon Quantum Computing in Sydney, Australia, uh, IQM in Finland, uh, and Bleximo in, in the east coast, uh, west coast of the US. Okay, so they're, they're, they're the companies doing it. A lot of money, a lot of companies. There's something there, right? Otherwise we wouldn't have all these companies and all these investors, right? IBM System 1, there it is. That's what it looks like, a 53 qubit. If we log into a cloud, you'll be logging into something that looks as sexy as that. Wow. So if you, that's what you get for $1,000 a minute. Uh, they actually paid like $3 million for it to a designer, very famous design house, to get something sexy, sexier than that, right? <laughs> we want it to look good. We want to beat Microsoft and Google. Okay, so that's what the Google one looks like. It's beautiful Google colors as usual. Uh, that four weeks ago, they announced the quantum supremacy. That's what it ran on. Uh, all of the, these levels are uh, cryogenics and cables. Uh, so it has kept uh, cold. It's actually um, the coldest place in the universe is uh, down here on a little quantum um, uh, processor with 53 qubits. Uh, 53 seems to be the magic number. Uh, I, I, IBM also announced 53 qubits. It's nothing to, don't worry, it's not 42. It's not the answer to you, but it's just a coincidence. <laughs> Happy coincidence. In fact, uh, I think they had 54, but one of them didn't work, so 53. It's just a coincidence. It's, you know, don't make anything out of that. It's just 53 is the magic number for us at the moment. Um, 
but yeah, so the, the layers, they're different temperatures, um, all that's cryogenics. The actual process is just like the processor in your phone. It's quite small, 53 qubits fits in a little chip. But they have to keep it very cold. Uh, so, yeah, a few millikelvins, coldest place. It, uh, it's 200 times colder than outer space, right? It's cold. Uh, there can be no interference, no vibrations, no sound vibrations, uh, no, no thermal vibrations, no noise, okay? These things are incredibly delicate. You touch one, it's a measurement. You'll put it into a state, and, and that will spoil the computation. We want the algorithm and the control software to put it into the states we want them to be in, not, not just some due to some noise. But they all decohere, even at 200 times the coldest place in the universe. These, they, they only can do about 100 operations before the noise becomes too big, and that's it. Okay, so we, we, we're limited in our operations. This is why quantum supremacy was so hard. Uh, it was because of the noise. Nothing, that was the main problem. Um, so if we can build uh, qubits which uh, are very resilient to noise and error corrected, then we could do maybe a thousand, uh, have a thousand gates uh, or a thousand computations. Then, you know, that's when quantum supremacy really starts happening. But it's really controlling the noise at the moment is the main reason that uh, we, we, uh, it was hard to surpass a classical computer. Uh, so anyway, that's what it looks like. Beautiful things, like nothing we've ever seen before, right? Am I right? That's amazing looking, beautiful device. And that, that's what the um, processor looks like. That's the 53 qubit, 10 nanometers, 10 nanometers, sorry. So that 10 nanometers is a centimeter, right? Yeah, so that, that's how big it is. And that, that's what gave us quantum supremacy. And Google's been working on that for 20 years now, believe it or not. And so has Microsoft. IBM has been working on it for 40 years. So it didn't, didn't start yesterday. Cool. But it's getting all the attention now, which is why I'm speaking here to you today and not 10 years ago. Hi. Does it have the same architecture uh, yeah. as the IBMs? Well? Yes, they do. They're both supercomputing. That's a good question. They're, yes, superconducting. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So there's iron traps. The two main are super, superconducting and iron traps. Google and IBM are both using superconducting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you haven't mentioned, and there might be some confusion, at least for me, what is the difference between supercomputers and quantum computings? Yeah. So supercomputers are classical computers, right? Big warehouses, big data centers, football fields, and uh, they use 10 megawatt. You know, you think of the Facebook data center, the Google data center, the Microsoft Azure data center, IBM, you know, the big Goldman Sachs data centers. That, those are all class. They're full, chock full with classical, 100% classical. They're not a quantum computer to be seen. So, you know, we can get the same out of this as we can out of one of those huge data centers. That, that's, that's about the size of me, right, a human being. Yeah. So they're very powerful because it, it's linear for classical compared with exponential 53. 2 to the 53 gives us as much compute as the um, uh, data center, the biggest uh, supercomputer in the world. I think it's called Summit. It's actually, I think IBM made it. It's full of uh, Intel CPUs and NVIDIA GPUs. But it goes linear in the number of transistors. These things go exponential in a number of qubits. So, so yeah. Sorry, are there any hybrid like a classical and uh, quantum computers? Yeah, so that's a good question too. So what we're seeing now in this intermediate stage is people having a quantum, uh, uh, this quantum processor is a coprocessor, so, so it's kind of joined to a, um, a, a classical computer here, the classical CPU and the QPU, CPU, QPU joined. So that's like the, you know how uh, in AI and machine learning you have the NVIDIA GPU is like a coprocessor to the CPU and it offloads anything that's good at, that it needs matrix multiplication for and then back to the CPU, GPU, CPU. So it's the same thing here. You can do what you do on a classical CPU, but if you need the quantum uh, for any sort of t quantum algorithm calculation, then you, you pass it over to this guy it does its computation in a microsecond and passes it back into the CPU again, which does uh, GUI or whatever you want to do with a classical computer. So it's a good question. We're looking at a hybrid kind of systems. We could have a CPU, GPU, QPU, ASIC, you know. It could be a real zoo, a neuromorphic, you know. We're, we're getting to that point where we have all these different types of architecture. And we use the architecture, the right architecture for the job. So yeah, these will ultimately just be, just be coprocessors. Yeah. But we'll always need a classical computer out front to type the commands in, right? 
a while back, I watched Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum, yeah. um, squirm when, a when asked the question as to whether quantum com computing would impact on the relevance of blockchain. Yeah. He never answered. Yeah. And I still don't know the answer. What, what, you, what is the answer? It's going to destroy blockchain. <laughs> How soon? Blockchain. Today. Google and IPM if they wanted to, if they're malicious. Are you yeah. Yeah, because like I mentioned earlier, it's the encryption. So blockchain works on encryption, right? If you don't have that, you don't have blockchain. So yeah. Uh, I'm sure people will say that there's other kinds of encryption they might use instead of the current encryption. So be my guest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Peter, I've heard a rumor you have 77 slides, mm. and we, we may have to. 70, you, 70, 70. So, sorry. So we. we there's so many interesting bits we need to get to. Okay. So I'll just leave you to pick out the highlights, and then we can have a very wide-ranging discussion. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're still running this talk in classical time. We don't have the opportunities to do quantum with okay, the multiple fine. versions happening simultaneously. Are we? Okay. Okay. Fine. We haven't. Got, uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, yeah, I did mention the cryogenic. So yeah, this is this is how they're built. They start off at room temperature and go down. And here is the uh, Nevin's Law, the doubling every year or so. Uh, this is Rigetti, have made a very bold announcement that they will have 128 qubits in 2019. They made that two years ago. They're not going to make it, but that's okay. We'll forgive them, but maybe 2020, uh, you know, 53 is good. Google and IBM both did 53. It's all good. Um, here's the timeline. I'm going to go quick through these, and then we'll slow down a little bit for the application. But this is the timeline. I've kind of given you the background, and I think you'll, you know, understand how mysterious quantum is now. So this is kind of Feynman, Shaw's algorithm, uh, and then annealing. This is D-Wave, a uh, few, few, few bits of processes, and then the cloud-based, uh, IBM cloud-based in 2017. So, you know, this is what I've been talking about from 1980, about 40 years. This is a quantum computing timeline. The classical computing would go back to 1940, and, you know, so we started 40 years later, and boom. There's the Grover's algorithm, you know, algorithmic development, software development, hardware development, people. Um, and there's, there's, there's the Moore's law for, uh, somebody, you know, I mentioned coherence. This is, um, if we can lower coherence, this is how we, we get to do more calculations, more gates. That's a very steep line. So it's like, I think, about a billion in 20 years. So that's, that's a very, 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 very encouraging graph. Okay, it's not like Moore's law, it's much, much steeper. Okay, so this is a decoherence. So remember I said noise was part of it. Number of qubits is one part, but also lowering that noise is the other part, is the other axis. And so this axis is doing incredibly well, better than anyone thought. No one thought, all these uh, theoreticians, Charlie Bennett, all these guys, um, they never thought uh, that, that it would be this steep. And they, they always say it. They say, we didn't expect to have a 53 qubit quantum computer in the cloud in 2020. We just didn't. Okay. We thought 2030. Okay, so we're, we're, you know, we're doing well. But the other thing is, people don't know if that can keep going, right? Even theoretically. But, but that, that's a very, very encouraging graph. It looks pretty complicated, but it's very encouraging. So there's the architecture. This is what somebody asked, the classical computer. Interface electronics, like it's a coprocessor. We put the input in through the classical computer. What we need to do quantum mechanically, we, we, we give to the quantum QPU and it goes back. And there's a control uh, system. And the, the, these are basically microwave pulses or, or, fo or photon laser which control the qubits. So, so that, that's a tricky technical part to, to, to this control system. So not only do we have to build the qubits, but then we have to control them exactly according to what the algorithm wants us to do. And that's hard because unlike a bit, a classical bit, which will stay in its state forever pretty much, right? Maybe one in, uh, 10, to, uh, one in 10 to the 12 or something will, will have an error or an, in a given uh, day or something like that. With classical, with quantum, it's very, it's like 0.1%. One in a thousand will, will have an error, right? Not one in uh, a thousand trillion. So, so it's because of the nature of quantum mechanics, it's all about measurement. As soon as you measure or something bumps in or gets a vibration, that puts it into a state. So the, the, so the error is really what's holding us up. It's controlling the error with error control. Uh, building systems that have this high quality of qubit, and also building error correcting code, which if it senses sees an error, it can actually 
like uh, with classical you know, error correcting codes, we, we, we do that all the time. We do the similar quantum error correcting codes, okay? So they're just extremely fragile, hard, difficult things to build, okay? Uh, and so, but this is what the architecture looks like. Uh, and that's what the gates look like, or oh, just moving on. Um, and the circuits, that's what a circuit diagram looks like. These things are gates, quantum gates, um, and this is a, each one of these is a quantum computation. So you, it's like classical gates, but quantum gates, you decide what you want to do, what algorithm you're trying to solve, and then you build, you put the qubits into these um, specific states, and then you perform a measurement at the end, and that measurement is the computation. Uh, so it's very similar to classical, except they're fragile, uh, very susceptible to noise, and they obey, these are obeying the laws of quantum quantum mechanics, not classical. Right. Okay, and that's what the um, Google control system looked like. Um, they published some of these photos with their paper, I think. And uh, so that's, these are microwave pulses controlling the qubits so at the physical level, right? So this is quite revealing, really. I mean, this is, this is about as close as we can get to understanding, you know, how we're controlling qubits. Okay, so the gates are actually what we're building, and this is how we're putting the qubits into their different states. So it's, not, it's not like the classical transistor, right? This is where we're at today. So these are microwave pulses which, um, acting on a certain quantum system, will we'll put that quantum system in a, in a different state. This will put it in one state, this in another. Okay, and so that's all the hardcore engineering technical stuff out the way. Here are some software companies. Um, the British, uh, Australia, US, US, uh, Israel, Singapore, and Canada. So it's more, you know, everywhere. It's not just happening in the US in Silicon Valley or somewhere. It's happening all over. And these are very interesting companies. They've already, they, as a software company, you don't have to raise as much. You have to have $100 million, right? As you all know in this room, probably. Um, you know, you can start a software company with a few guys or girls and, you know, and keep going on eating sandwiches for a couple of years, then getting <laughs> a prototype and then going to VC for a million, right? You don't need 100 million. So all of these have raised a few million. And they've got runways of two or three years, and, and you know, they're, every day they're writing code, quantum computing code. So it's, it's very exciting stuff. And I encourage you all to you know, go and you know, look up QControls website, right? And it's amazing what they're doing. Really. Okay, and then uh, the framework, and of course, uh, anybody can write anything code, but we need the hardware, j just to put a little, you know, brakes on a little bit. It's like, okay, we have all this amazing software, but, you know, can we even build the hardware? Yeah. But they, these are very interesting companies, very, very interesting people, entrepreneurial types. Um, and uh, so these are the different frameworks that will run on the uh, IBM machine. It's called Kiskit. This is like kind of the operating system layer. Uh, Microsoft is calling it as a QDK, not their software development kit, quantum development kit, QDK. Google's calling it a CERC. Uh, there's an open source called Open Fermion, um, and Forest is Rigetti, and Xanadu have something called Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane. So these are, these are all like the operating system layer software, okay? And, it, you know, if you, you sort of want to dip your feet in, I would go to some of these websites and have a look at the software, because they, they publish it all on GitHub, and they have Jupyter Notebooks where they put little tutorials and stuff. To do. This is kind of probably the right place to start if you w were a little bit more technically minded. So, so what's the role within open source patents, IP, copyrights, etc.? Because you mentioned that there's one of it that is um, proprietary and like the one from Google and from Microsoft yeah. and the other one it's open source anyone yeah. can use them abuse them etc yeah. which one is starting to be more successful uh, where is more money going yeah. and also if you create one open source you don't need a hundred million dollars for anything no that's right so all of these have an open source component this one's fully open source they all have an open source component uh, but some of they leave proprietary it's kind of like the Red Hat model actually so Red Hat makes money right IBM just bought them for 30 billion the biggest uh, um, software purchase in the history of the world. So yeah, open, don't say open source is worth nothing. It is worth a lot of money. Open source is very valuable if you build it yourself. But the hardware is still going to cost money. The yeah. hundred million is needed not for just uh, writing the software. Yeah. It's to actually build that very complicated 
hardware. Yeah, but I, I guess it's a, it leads to a bigger point. It's a great question because the, the Quantum Computing Society um, community, because it's kind of new, it, it definitely has this open source philosophy about it. So it's all open source. Everything's open source. It's not, it's not like Windows in the 80s, right? This, this is the Linux generation. Everything, it's all coming from academia. We're used to open source. Everything's on GitHub. It's all on Jupyter Notebooks. They put everything online. Maybe they keep the application software for specific applications for specific companies, maybe a fertilizer company or something. They keep that proprietary because that's what the company will pay them for. But the actual uh, underlying core is, is all open source. It's, it's a good thing. Yeah. And it's helping to accelerate the field. But that, that again, that software, like David said, you need the hardware. Okay? To run it on. Uh, here's some algorithms. I won't uh, go too deep into here, but just to show you, you know, these, these are very well known in the community, VQE, um, QAE, QAE, you know, I mean, these, these are just acronyms, but uh, these are the quantum algorithms that do useful stuff. They actually can be used to calculate and to simulate chemical interactions and optimizations. They, they, these are the algorithms. So you, you, you have there, some clever guys done the math, it's probably some math professor actually, quantum information theorist. The coder, the software developer, will come along and turn that math into code, normally just using Python and one of these open source frameworks, put it in a Jupyter Notebook, and then we apply the code to our given situation and make money from that. That's the part of the process we make money from. Okay, but here's some algorithms, just to sort of complete the picture. So we've seen hardware, software, algorithms. Lastly, what's left is the applications, which I've just started talking about. And so this is sort of the very end. Uh, or the last part of my talk, depending how quickly I can get through it. Um, so basically, applications fall into three areas uh, for quantum. Optimization, machine learning, and quantum materials, which is the Feynman simulating chemistry, right? Machine learning and optimization. Those are the three main areas, okay? There's only three mo main areas. You could put encryption as a fourth as well. Okay, optimization is, um, uh, you know, optimizing portfolios of banks, they love doing stuff like that, uh, insurance companies. Um, it's traffic, routing traffic more efficiently than a classical algorithm could. You know, it's traffic, that's what optimization is all about. Machine learning is machine learning. Um, it's useful in a lot of stuff. You know, you get your training data set, uh, use machine learning, uh, then you offload some of that computation to the QPU, the quantum processor, and back to the classical. So that, that's where that comes in, okay? So certain aspects of the machine learning computation is very intensive. Some of that can be offloaded and back. And then the stuff I'm most interested in is um, quantum materials, chemistry, because, you know, it, it's going to help us um, come up, solve, you know, the grand challenges of energy and uh, climate change and uh, cancer and longevity, because everything ultimately is molecular. You know, nature is quantum mechanical, damn it, right? So this is, is, is trillions and trillions and trillions of dollar industry. If we can build these hardware, if we can go from 53 to 100 to 200 to 400 and error correct stuff, we can start building solar cells 10 times more efficiently. We can start, you know, uh, with the drug discovery process, you know, discovering drugs and for Alzheimer's and, and, and helping us solve longevity. I mean, it's huge. Right? So classical computing has got us a heck of a long way, right? But quantum will take us very quickly, much, much further. Okay, so very exciting. Can uh, be used like to solve generic uh, NP problem like the set covering and yeah. not uh, strictly related to nature, but like more mathematical, uh, like P against NP that is like a debate that maybe yeah. can be solved with. Yeah. So. That's uh, some some of those. Uh, th this is a cla this is a complexity theory again, right? So um, some of these mathematical problems can be solved using classical, uh, and they don't lend themselves to quantum algorithms. Okay. Yeah, but some do. So th there's a bit of a two circles. You know, classical uh, things that can be solved classically, things that can be solved quantum mechanically, and th the intersection in the middle. That yeah. So yeah, it's not a black and white cut and dry, but yes, it will definitely be used to solve some mathemat outstanding mathematical problems, but not all of them. But it might be that as uh, more and more people see that quantum computing is a reality, yeah. more clever people will think of new algorithms which have never been imagined before. Yeah. And some of the currently insoluble or seemingly insoluble problems in mathematics and elsewhere mm. might suddenly yield to new quantum computing algorithms which haven't yet been discovered as more people get onto it. Yeah. It's another unknown in this field. 
Yeah, that's a good point, David. So a lot of work's been done by theoreticians, uh, um, you know, theoretical computer scientists, quantum, you know, quantum information theory on the quantum algorithms. It's, it's a brand new field. We, we, we've maybe done 1% of it. It's huge, it's huge. So the theoretical mathematical for, uh, you know, quantum, theoretical quantum computer science is a big thing. There's a guy called Scott Aronson, used to be at MIT, just moved to Austin, Texas. Uh, he, he's the main guy there, just as Preskill is the main guy in quantum information theory at Caltech. Deutsch, Oxford, Aronson, um, you know, there's this uh, Aram at MIT, uh, there's Ashley Montanero at Bristol, uh, Tony Cubitt, which is a great name for a quantum, <laughs> yeah, okay, I don't know how that happened, but his, his real name is Tony Cubitt, okay, C-U-B-B-I-T, B-I-T-T. Uh, uh, um, so these guys are very well known in the field, and, and you should definitely read their papers, they're amazing, okay, it's good stuff. Okay, so if you're that way inclined. Right, application software companies. So Rayco, spin out of UCL, um, Phasecraft, uh, John Morton, UCL, Riverlane, Steve Briley, Cambridge, Software, Q and Tropica, QCWare, California. So these are companies that are interested in making money, right? So they, they're building software to solve uh, problems, mostly in chemistry, sometimes in optimization. Uh, so yeah, check them out. Uh, so Microsoft has and IBM, they're just getting their big arms, their multi-billion dollar arms and sweeping up every single person with a PhD in quantum information theory and saying come, come and we'll give you money and we'll put your logo on our website and you can use our quantum computers for free and because this is an industry that's going to be worth trillions and we want all the smartest people to come to us and not IBM and IBM do the same thing, right? So, this is, so if you go to the IBM site, you'll see all the same company. It's quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> Google's behind the curve, but they have a way of catching up. Okay, so UCL, Canada, Cambridge, uh, Canada, Cambridge, but just been bought by Rigetti, Texas, Toronto. So Patra, a very interesting company. Uh, QLab. You don't seem to have many Chinese companies on your slides. In part, we That's have Baidu because it's very secretive, David. <laughs> they are very secretive. More secretive than the Russians. They are very secretive. We so in the West tend to be. Maybe we're too open, right? Maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> They're doing it. They're investing more than us. They've put $10 billion into their quantum effort. Yeah, so, well, yeah. you know, it's the, the usual... I, have, I haven't got much to say about China. I don't know <laughs> what they're doing. <laughs> I just know what John Preskill's doing and David Deutsch, and they're, they're smart enough for me. Okay, so um, consultancies. This is something, uh, yeah, again, you, you, you need to be pretty clever to um, actually start a consultancy like PhD in quantum information clever. It's a very nascent early industry, but some of the big guys like Accenture, they're just hiring people straight out of Oxford, et cetera, with a PhD in quantum information. Come work for us because, you know, we want you to go into clients and tell them how they can use quantum computing so we can, you know, charge you out at a thousand bucks an hour or whatever. These are the smaller guys who have been around a little while who have super, I mean, if you look at one qubit's website, I mean, every single person of 100 consultants has a PhD or postdoc or professor in quantum information theory, right? So this is kind of level, right? It's not so you just don't go out and say, oh, quantum computing, yeah, I'll start a company. <laughs> so you gotta know what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay, so chemistry. This is, uh, we wanna simulate chemistry. Uh, remember high school? This is chemistry. <laughs> This is chemistry. This is what we're talking about, right? The periodic table and how elements combine and how a quantum computer can help us to uh, simulate how that all works. It's called molecular dynamics, okay? We've made a lot of progress using classical computers, uh, but they're, they're only ever an approximation, right? We can solve the Schrodinger equation for the many body problem on a classical computer but we can do it directly on, we have to make all sorts of approximations, but we can do it directly using a quantum computer, just directly. So we have 10 atoms in a molecule, electronic structure, remember the electronic structure from chemistry, high school, probably as far as most of us got. Um, a quantum computer using those microwave pulses that we saw the diagram of uh, can change the states of all the qubits in that 53 qubit uh, process we saw from IBM and Google and do a computation and actually model the molecular dynamics exactly. 
No, no approximation, exactly. Just like Feynman's dream, Feynman's vision, right? <coughs> this is what it is. This is chemistry, and this is what it's good for. And we, we are chemistry. The world is made of atoms. It's quantum mechanical, damn it, right? Okay, so this is the types of interactions, going a little deeper, that can happen. Covalent, ionic, you know, all the different super snazzy chemistry, which I hated. I did physics because it was way too complicated for me. Could never, there's nothing general here. But uh, apparently quantum computers can just come along and, and, and simulate these. Not apparently, they can, right? You just run it. You don't have to do anything, no math anymore. It's just you, you just say, okay, I want to simulate uh, uh, nitrogen uh, ammonia because I want to make fertilizer more efficiently. 4% of the world's energy is used making fertilizer. 4%. Right? If we could make that 10 times more efficient, we solved, we, we saved a hell of a lot of energy, time, money, climate change, et cetera, right? And we could do that. Maybe the 53 qubit on the IBM cloud is sufficient, and you can guarantee that IBM are using that right now to solve that exact problem. It's called the Harbour-Bosch process, right? That's just one, right? We can do a lot, all right? Just simple chemistry. Okay, so applications, here we go. Uh, you know, here's our wish list. What do we want to solve if I had a magic wand, right? And I do, it's called a quantum computer, I have a magic wand now. So what do I want to solve? I want to build new materials, I want a more efficient energy, I want to solve climate change, protein folding, I want to do drug discovery and that's how drugs work, they fold protein. I want to understand genomics, industrial catalysts, high temperature superconductors, at room temperature, run at room temperature so we don't have to freeze everything down and use all that energy to cool. We can just have superconductors. We have them now, but they, they don't run at room temperature. So this is a, all these problems quantum computers can solve. And here's some companies directly attacking these problems today. We've got GTN, who are a spin out of UCL. Nitramark in Canada, 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 Canada. Well, Canada's well represented. Uh, QLab, California, QSimulate, California. Uh, so G G GTN are representing the UK there. But yeah, these are companies, if you go to their website, like Zapata, they have all the white papers, the papers, the open source frameworks. Yeah, it's there, it's happening today. It's not happening, it ha happened yesterday, right? This stuff's all going on as we speak. We're raising lots of money to do that. Zapata just raised 30 million. They had a very good round recently, yeah. Okay, so molecular energy level, this is what we do. This is exactly what we're solving mathematically. This is what, you know, how we describe the interactions between two chemicals, two molecules. Not sure if, you know, I, I sort of got to that point, I guess, in my education. Some of you might have seen, not have seen that, but this is what the quantum computers solve. These are, they, they, they solve and they plot and they give us the uh, very, very close agreement using the VQE algorithm I mentioned earlier with experiment, the black line. Okay, very, very, very good agreement. Okay, in 53 qubits we can do this sort of thing, yeah. Um, molecular dynamics, I mentioned, you know, proteins. Proteins are kind of a bit big for 53 qubits right now. We're, we're doing the smaller molecules, the uh, Harbour-Bosch maybe, the ammonia uh, molecule. But if we scale 100, 200, 1,000 qubits, get the noise down, we'll be able to simulate protein folding, which is incredibly, incredibly uh, exciting if we can do that. Because right now we can't do that with the classical computer. Given the largest classical computer in the world, we, we just can't. It's out of bounds. It's out of reach. It will take us the ages of the universe. We can't do it. But with quantum, we can. Yeah, 1,000 qubits, we can do that. Okay, let's hope we can build them. So molecular dynamics, uh, that's what it is. And then we'll race through these because these are classical frameworks uh, for molecular dynamics. These are quantum ones. So if you go to the Microsoft QDK Chem Library or the Google Open Fermion or the IBM QuizKit Aqua, you can see in code these frameworks that do quantum chemistry simulations. And you can use them and you can run them in your Jupyter notebooks. And they're real, right? Just need a... And then, then, and then, you know, you can pay money and run them on these 53 <laughs> qubits, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, but, you know, you can do it on a 5 qubit for free. And it works. Here's one I uh, selected earlier. It's uh, IBM Kiskit. They're probably, uh, you know, probably out in the lead. Uh, I mean, they, they have the hardware and they have the software. And they've put a uh, quantum computer on the clouds. They put 10 platforms on the cloud. Google have the hardware. They put nothing on the cloud. 
Microsoft don't have the hardware because they're trying to do topological quantum computing, which is error free, right? If they, if they make it, uh, you know, then, then we're all set. We'll, we'll just drop the Google IBM immediately and they'll quickly pick up on topological because it's error corrected and uh, we're, we're good to go. We don't mi need millions of qubits for error correction. We can have a thousand qubits and they're all clean and they don't decohere. It's called top topological quantum computing and it guy Kitayev and Preskill at Caltech are the guys who do the theory for that stuff. They've proven it's true. Michael Friedman's a field medal winner. Uh, Microsoft hired him 20 years ago, put him out in Santa Barbara and didn't talk to him for 10 years till he wrote them an email saying, hey guys, I'm a bit lonely. Um, do you still want me to uh, you know, work on topological quantum? They said yes. Um, so, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, but, um, <laughs> so, Kiskit, I chose Kiskit because IBM have the hardware, they've made it available, they have the software, and, you know, they've probably been doing it 40 years. I mean, IBM, as much as you maybe don't like them or, my, you know, for whatever reason, they're, they're probably in the lead right now, okay, for today, maybe not for tomorrow, for today they are. So, that's why I chose Kiskit. Kiskit Alpha, Aqua, and then there's Bar, and then you can go look it up on the uh, website. You do a pip install for those who know Python. It's like that. It's that simple. It's just like classical, except behind it, you have a quantum processing unit. Instead of a CPU, you have a QPU. Snazzy stuff. They made it on purpose, like user-friendly, so it's not, the transition isn't like this big cliff. It's just like, okay, it's Python. I can code in Python. It's just a QPU. I'm using the laws of quantum physics in the back end. It's pretty cool, really. Uh, and so here's what it looks like. It's all Python again. That's an energy calculation. It does that. The, you know, it calculates fundamental properties of molecular interactions, molecular dynamics, which is chemistry. And then that's why some tutorials for those interested later. You can click on those links and, and, and play around. If your heart's content, maybe start up the next quantum chemistry company. Who knows? All right. But it's there, it's out there for us to le learn and use, okay? So, and that, that was all IBM Kiskit. So they put a lot of good stuff online. Now, finally, okay, finishing up. Grand challenges, we've kind of talked about these a little bit. Drug discovery, so we've seen the startups and the big pharma, both uh, uh, attacking the space, tackling the space. Longevity, so we want to understand the biological process of aging. Clearly it's molecular, so we need a little bit to do a little bit more work on the experimental side, but once we understand it a little better, and it will be a process, or maybe a 20 year process, but I think, you know, 53 qubits, we'll have more hardware, we'll understand the processes better, and I think in 20 years we, we could solve aging. What do you think, David? Yes, it's possible. Yeah. Not Thanks. certain, but possible. Yeah, with quantum computers, it's going to help accelerate. Yeah. So it's a great grand challenge, a great use case. Energy, material science, make more efficient batteries, because after all, batteries are just chemical interactions. Make more efficient solar panels and, you know, solve climate change. Help them to, I mean, use quantum co computers to help solve climate change, help solve longevity, help solve drug discovery. Right? So we've got classical computing, which does it all for us now, but it takes the age of the universe to do any of this stuff. Quantum computers can do it in microseconds if and when we build 5300 quantum corrected qubits. Exciting, exciting, exciting stuff. So biotech, uh, protein folding, this protein folding has four different stages. We start with the simplest ones because we only have the hardware to do that, but as the hardware increases, you know, maybe one day we can model uh, a four billion uh, base pair DNA molecule. Who the heck knows, right? In 20 years, that is entirely possible. Entirely possible. It would be amazing if we could do that. So this, is, this is Feynman's dream. You simulate everything quantum mechanically. That would be amazing. If we could do that, that would be truly amazing. But it's 20 years off, but I think we can do it. Yeah. I'm a bit confused that all this, uh, you know, uh, software and application ecosystem has been built up, but yes. it just kind of reach uh, com uh, quantum yeah. supremacy. So, what's the, what's the, you know, uh, good point. Uh, good point. That was my criticism when I first got into this field two years ago. But you know what? I've softened a little bit. It's good to have the software ready to go. All these open source frameworks like Kiskit and. And so when the 53 qubits do come online, it's 2 to the 53, remember, it's computational, and we've just seen quantum supremacy, they're there ready for us. Maybe they were built two years ago, open for me on by Google. But 
See, people have been thinking about this for 40 years, and certainly for the last 20 years. So they're, they're, they're ready. The software's ready. We're waiting on the hardware. We're waiting on the engineering. It's a hard problem, right? Yeah, but yeah, good point, good point. Yeah. We don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves with the software when the hardware's still here, right? So we've got to rationalize. That's a good point. Thank you. Longevity. Uh, I think these are my final slides. So, I mean, recently, you know, uh, Juvenescence has just raised over $150 million in the last year for, for longevity research. Um, you know, the UK government is just in the last year. This is, these are all headlines from the last year. So longevity is a thing, right? Longevity research is a thing. Maybe five years ago it wasn't, but today it is. People are putting real money. Um, and, you know, we, we, we sort of have a broad understanding of the causes of aging. Probably not to the level, the molecular level that we'll need for the quantum computer to do anything useful. But we're getting there, right? We're starting out here and we're coming down and coming down. And as our measuring instruments get better and we can measure molecular dynamics and test our theories, then, you know, we can come up with theories and run quantum computers to simulate some of these processes which cause aging, which, you know, will be degray and a lot of futurists, you know, this is a big futurist theme, right? It's about aging and it is, it's just a big, big theme. And I think everybody wants to solve aging. Who doesn't and live healthier, longer lives? So at the molecular level, quantum computing will accelerate this process. And here are the companies. Um, you know, that some of us may be familiar with, some not, but they're, some of them are doing great, great stuff, and they have, some of them are big, you know, they're putting billions behind it, the Google Calico, and Juvenescence has raised a lot, Human Longevity, Craig Venter, it's exciting stuff, right? And if we can put a quantum computer on the back end, you know, I just feel like writing emails to all these people, and go, have you thought about, have you heard about, the 50, have you made that connection? Quantum Supremacy, 53 Qubit, Microsoft, yeah. You know, solving. Have you made it? I hope you have, because if you haven't, just get on it, right? Get on it. Start using quantum. Don't just use classical. Start using quantum. Anyway, I'm sure. You know, I don't know. It's an open question. Um, so books and reports. Uh, you know, this is all about how aging is, is a thing. David's book there, and cover of Time. Can Google solve death? And Jamal and wrote a book, Juvenescence. Uh, David Sinclair at Harvard. Brand new book. It's all good, right? Marie, so, you know, we're, we're on the journey. Let, let's speed it up using quantum. I don't know. So here's the people. George Church, Aubrey, Jim Allen, Liz Parrish, and David Sinclair. Some of the people involved. Uh, energy. So that was longevity, just like a big, broad overview. But the, the takeaway is that aging process is molecular dynamics, ultimately, and quantum computers can simulate that. Okay, so energy, same thing. Uh, Energy is molecular dynamics, quantum computers can solve that. And here's some of the material challenges, not just uh, energy, but you know, clean, yeah, clean energy, plastics, uh, water security, anything with chemistry, which is, I can't even think of a process that doesn't involve chemistry, to be honest. So, um, you know, it feels a little bit sometimes like I'm waving this magic quantum wand about, saying, you know, we'll solve everything. But, uh, you know, I think, we're just waiting on the hardware, to be honest. Okay, so the road ahead, Alan Turing said in 1950, you know, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. It's the same. Nothing's changed. <coughs> 70 years later, 2020, we're coming up to, you know, there's, there's plenty of work to be done in quantum computing, just like there was in classical. Uh, so it's still completely relevant. So what can we expect uh, in terms of progress? Well, well, improved hardware, better software, uh, new algorithmic developments, as David mentioned, and applications, a lot of work on uh, understanding chemistry, material science, pharmaceutical drug discovery and optimization. <coughs> okay, a lot of work there, working hand in hand with companies. The main experts in all of these fields, with com quantum computing experts from IBM, Microsoft, Google, consultancies, working, sitting in the same room and saying, you know, this is how we, this is where we are with quantum computing, this is your chemistry problem. This is your drug discovery. Let's see if we can make that work. Right. And that's happening. Uh, improved hardware, we need more qubits. We need greater connectivity. We need higher fidelity, and that just means better quality of qubits and better error correction. I've mentioned all of those, but this is just summarizing it. Algorithmic development, there's new quantum algorithms to be discovered, as David mentioned. We're probably only 1% done there. 
uh, deeper understanding, quantum complexity theory, proofs of outstanding conjectures. That's the sort of stuff David Deutsch might work on, John Preskill. Um, and better software at all levels of the stack. Just like classical quantum computing has a stack. So systems level, error correction, compilers, control layer, the whole lot. The whole lot. We need uh, software engineers to build that. And Peter, do you have any sense of what the companies themselves, the big companies, would say are the most important of these things to be solved? Which things are actually the bottleneck for them going a lot faster? Yeah. Is it that they need to make progress in all 20 of these things or right, 19, right. Uh, 16 of these things simultaneously? Right. Or is there one that if they could have uh, more money or... Uh, mm. uh, some, uh, something pops up from uh, an alien spacecraft yeah. helping us to solve a problem, what would it be? I would think it's mostly to do with the hardware, but all four aspects. So we need more qubits, uh, better connected, all-to-all -all connectivity is the holy grail, uh, higher fidelity, topological is 100% fidelity, and uh, better error correction. Okay, so all of those. Uh, it's not just a case of throwing money, it's just yeah, it's a research project, you know, Google have the best people working on this, IBM and Microsoft, they do, they just simply do have the best people in the world working on it, they have professors like John Martinez, you know, uh, who've been doing it all their lives working on this and paying them good money, so it's not just about, if we had more people, if we had like 20 John Martinez's and, you know, at Google and 20 at Microsoft and 20 at IBM, you know, but it's come. It's, ha it's happened quite quickly. You know, we didn't really expect to be at 53 qubits in 2020, to be honest. So, if somebody's got a youngster in the family trying to figure out what they should study, how yeah. long is it going to take them to become really useful? Is it uh, 20 years of study to become uh, like yeah. uh, useful, or, or can they do it in three or four years? Yeah. Well, first of all, you have to love quantum physics. There's no point doing something if you don't, because you, you won't be good at it, and you'll you just be miserable. Okay. So, <laughs> good quantum physicists are born; they're not made. That is simple. So a question from Simon at the back. So what, uh, what impact does this have on uh, Ray Kurzweil's date of 2045 for the singularity? Yeah. Ooh, okay. I think, you know, well, longevity will, will have cracked it by then. Yeah. Yes, 26 years, 25 years. Yeah, I think we'll have cracked longevity. I think we'll have cracked energy. The climate change will we'll, we'll solve climate change. Uh, by using Coswell's assumptions tend to assume that there's a one continuous uh, set of uh, pro progress. And of course it goes through various waves. There was the relay waves and then there was vacuum tubes and then there was CPUs and there might be something new next. But it's possible that this could cause uh, yeah. an increase in the pace. Yeah. And if this really does work, then some things that Ray Kurzweil predicted for 2045 could potentially be here a lot sooner. Yeah. Again, there's a lot of ifs and buts in that. So it, uh, perhaps the, 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 the smooth curve is no longer entirely applicable because there's a, the most fundamental phase change coming. Yeah, I agree. And just to add to what David just said, um, Kurzweil, it's exponential, but it's a smooth ex exponential. David, he didn't put, it, this is a step change. It, it's a different exponential. Suddenly we go from here, the classical exponential, over to here, the quantum computing exponential, and it's not a factor of two or 10. It's like it, lifetime of the universe, a microsecond, is immeasurable, right? So Kurzweil, he, he, he didn't, he forgot about quantum. So I guess the big message we are getting is that, uh, you know, it, there's no uncertainty that this is happening. It's really about uh, what the timing is uh, going to be it for is. this. It's all about timing. Uh, and uh, uh, so it'll be good to understand again, you know, of how did this happen sooner than it expected? And, you know, what really happened there? Yeah. Uh, you know, why, why was it expected to be 2030 and instead was 2020? And yeah. then how is that going to, you know, how do you project that in the next few years? Yeah, um, I think it's because uh, many factors, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I was sitting inside of the lab at IBM, I could probably answer that question better. I mean, they took it seriously. Companies like Google and IBM, and my, they've been taking this stuff seriously for 20 years. Um, I've been for 40 years. I mean, really seriously, employing the best people, every professor they could get, lure them away from, they, they, they would hire them, make no mistake. And it just happened quicker. It just did. Yeah. Is it because they are actually spending more money on this now yeah. than previously people yeah. had expected? That in the way that uh, Google have made progress with DeepMind in solving yeah. problems like Go, mm -hmm. by using mm -hmm. classical computing rather than quantum computing. Yeah. But the same point is there that they outperformed what people had expected because they put larger teams onto it than yeah. people had previously thought would be yeah. feasible. They have, yeah. They're some of the wealthiest companies in the world and they are able to marshal 
Marshall Resources. So this is kind of answering the bigger questions right here. 2030 is when we'll have it. Okay, 2030. Um, so we're here. We're here. We're 2020. Uh, we've just achieved quantum supremacy. Uh, they're slightly noisy. I think the error is about 0.1%. That's the fidelity, okay? Uh, not one in a hundred. It was one in a hundred a little while ago. That's that very steep curve we saw, the T2 curve. We're about 0.1%. Uh, we're expecting that. That's on a Moore's Law type of curve, exponential curve. We expect that 0.01%. And then we're out here, and that's a good thing. And this topological comes along, and then we're kind of here. We're, we're, we're off this chart, okay? Topological is a very hard problem. But if we just stick to the superconducting and iron traps, uh, then non-topological, then by 2030, the error will have come down and the number of qubits will be high enough. Remember I said those four things? It's like a, uh, IBM have a published paper about quantum volume, they call it, where those four factors were on it. So m more qubits, more connectivity, uh, more quality, and better error correction. Okay, and so this is what that graph is saying. If we, all of those four come down exponentially, which we're expecting they will, there's no reason not to, then by 2030, we'll, we'll be there. <laughs> Incredible. Okay, finally, just summing up everything I said, we're in a noisy intermediate state quantum era. This is what John Preskill called it, the NISC era, uh, about five years ago at Preskill. He, he, he predicted this curve here. He said, you know, for 10 years, we're going to have noisy, uh, the error correction won't be quite good enough, not quite enough qubits, maybe 100, 1,000, quite high errors, 0.1%. It's still very, very good compared to 20 years ago, but he called that era the NISC era. So this is the NISC era, these 10 years. Um, and uh, that's sort of playing out. Um, we need better, more, better uh, error corrected qubits. Um, you know, people are working on the software stack and the algorithms. And quantum cubes will revolutionize everything, including chemistry. Nature is quantum mechanical, damn it. And there's some references for you. Uh, videos, there's John Martinez just a week ago talking about quantum supremacy. Definitely recommend you check that out. Uh, Ryan Babouche works at Google. Um, these are some classic books in the field. There's a new one written by uh, Bob Suter at IBM. Kiskit, nice introductory level one, just come out. I, uh, I think it's coming out in a week's time, actually. Uh, this one is a standard textbook. It's the best-selling textbook on physics ever written, and no one's ever heard of it. Um, <laughs> so, and it's this guy, Wild, from Louisiana. Uh, that's a <coughs> nice. He put the book on archive, which is beautiful. He open sources book for everybody. Quantum information theory, a little bit more technical, more of a theoretical side. And Programming Quantum Computers, there's a book on O'Reilly. O'Reilly, how mainstream is that? I'm programming quantum computers, right? You can buy it, like yeah. programming in Python, you know, it's like that. It's an well, O'Reilly book. Can, can we make this list available to people afterwards so they can click on it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> somehow, yeah, definitely, because you need to click, I don't know, you yeah. can tell me how to do that. Well, if you give me, I mean, you can let me have a PDF of the have slides, them. perhaps. I'll let you have them, yeah. And then uh, I'll send you the links. And there's some nice blogs. Um, this one here is on aging. This is quite a good one, the current state of longevity science. So it's kind of going down to the molecular level where we are and what the gaps, you know. And the rest are on uh, um, sort of chemistry, molecular dynamics. These are blogs, so these are entry level points. And then finally, the papers. Uh, these are very nice overview papers of quantum chemistry and um, quantum information. And this is John Preskill's paper, actually, who wrote in 2018. That, that was caused a stir when it came out, because he predicted the next 10 years at Caltech. The, that one, that's a nice one to start, maybe. And the quantum volume paper by IBM is here. And, and, and yeah, th this is uh, Nature. This is the one uh, on the cover of Nature that came out in the last issue of Nature. And the rest, electronic structure, uh, you know, you can dig down into the physics, the meat, right? It's good stuff. Okay, any, yeah, you're thinking. Well, first fast. of all, let's uh, give a huge applause to Peter for <laughs> taking through all of that. <laughs> so, come to Evan in a minute. Let's say, Tony, your hand was up. Thank you. Uh, what an excellent presentation. It's an underestimation, I think. Mm. Um, I've got two questions. The first one is the um, error correction to which you have uh, referred many times. Mm -hmm. Has anybody been thinking about um, putting the quantum computing into space where you have gra uh, zero gravity, yeah. you have uh, less noise, less vibration, perhaps yeah. more cosmic radiation? Uh, yeah. That's the first, first one. Yeah. The second one is applying the quantum computing to artificial neurons 
Yes. And yes. artificial neural networks. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So I'll take the second one first. So there was recently a paper published on quantum neural networks, right? <laughs> the title was Quantum Neural Networks. So there is an active area of research is um, using quantum computers to help um, model uh, neural networks, okay, artificial neural networks. Uh, and then there's the other more kind of out there, um, Roger Penrose, uh, is the brain using quantum mechanics, right? So there's two different fields there. One is kind of mainstream, they're using quantum computers to accelerate the neural network, classical neural network. The other is definitely not mainstream, uh, Penrose and Hameroff, is the brain fundamentally using a quantum mechanical process? I don't know, actually, the microtubules. It's a good question. I'm sure quantum computers can be used to apply there as well. Uh, first question, um, should, can, we, should we, can we and should we put quantum computers in outer space? Uh, remember I said that place in IBM labs and Google are, two, are 200 times colder than outer space, so we'd still have to build a big fridge to put it, so maybe not. Uh, in terms of reducing noise, maybe, but cosmic rays would be a huge problem. So I, d I think the answer is no, because yeah. But yeah, I don't know, it's a nice idea. Maybe speak to NASA. Well, Evan, you've got some thoughts on that as well. Yeah, um, I have a spin out company called QI, oh, yeah. which um, uh, we need a few million to uh, to do the first year's work, and the oh, only yeah. people who are interested in supporting us, interesting, are the Chinese. Oh, okay. I have two Zoom meetings a week trying to get this money out of them. Yeah. Um, but they want to learn everything about it before they give you the money, you know, which is typical. Um, what I ask is the, uh, the, uh, the uh, I'm a relatively novice in, in, the, in the quantum uh, computing area. Uh, what is interesting is that the way you uh, control the qubits is, is by microwave pulses. Yes. How do you actually read the outputs from that? Yeah, so to do the measurement, I think you use microwave again. To, but this time it's a read out instead yeah. of a read in. So yeah. yeah, but it's, it's, it's the information transported uh, using microwaves. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a photon, comes out a low energy photon, which is where. where yeah, where. yeah, okay. But some part of the electromagnetic spectrum, it may not be microwave, but yes, it has to be, right? Yeah, okay. And is, is it any possibility that, okay, we're going to solve climate change by doing clever uh, solar panels and I don't know what? Uh, they say you can't model the climate using um, uh, quantum computing. I mean, is, is that really a dead duck? No. Because that would be exceedingly powerful if you could get yeah. some idea on that. Yeah, sure. no, I agree. I was reading an article recently where people are, are, are proposing just that, to help model the climate using quantum computers. The way I could see that happening maybe is, uh, you know, how they uh, discretize the, the atmosphere, right, and put it into little boxes. So, yeah, maybe it's uh, you can make those... Uh, Voxels small enough that a quantum, that a, a classical computer would take the age of the universe. Right now, I think they're like a kilometer squared, so you can only do a very approximate uh, uh, approximation of the weather. But if you could get that down to a meter cubed or, or a centimeter cubed and run it on a quantum, yeah, that's that's what I'm seeing would happen. But I I bet IBM are working on that. That I guarantee you. Yeah. So I think um, it, it's it, the realization has come that potentially plants are using quantum mechanics or photosynthesis related to photonics though yeah so if you if you're oh, well. using if you're using that Anything then related to photonics. yeah <laughs> no. uh, okay fair enough Sorry. Uh, but you're also reducing the, the the temperature required because quantum mechanics is still happening at room temperature if not hotter uh, so if it's, if it's and it's still yes. chemistry that's being used yes. it ties into what we were saying earlier about everything is chemistry and uh, these are yeah. reactions so yeah. if we're going down that route and yeah, 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 maybe okay. something to explore that I don't know if you that's what you think um, hi so as a non-technical person yeah <laughs> um, my takeaway and I just want to comment on this is something along the lines that for linear business growth yeah has been enabled by linear computing and quantum computing enables complex complex exponential business growth enabling global wellness is that, a, is that a takeaway? Would you, would you, would you correlate mm. exponentiality of business and disruptive business models right, um, right. Through, com exponential compu or through quantum computing, whereas classical computing is more linear growth in the, the trajectory of business growth over the last Yeah, well, first of all, classical of, computing is exponential growth. It's okay. not linear. Moore's law is exponential. Hi, uh, two questions. So firstly, when it comes to real world applications, I was just wondering are there any sort of low hanging fruit you think might be 
you know, the first thing which makes a real impact in the real world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. secondly, I guess okay. th um, when it comes to quantum computing and artificial intelligence, you already mentioned mm -hmm. like trying to simulate artificial neural networks. Yeah. I just wondered if you're able to yeah. expand yeah. on that a little bit and sure. how these two yeah. things in might interact. Yeah, okay, so the first question. Yeah, that's a great question because remember I put the quantum supremacy. So that, that was, um, and I also put on a slide, that was um, had no real world application. So what, they were using it to sample from a probability distribution, which may or may not have some application in the future. But it was like a toy, it's like the hello world. You know, hello world, printing out hello world doesn't have any application in the real world too much, really, to be honest. Um, it's the same. That was a hello world, something in probability distribution. Most people thought that would be something, um, you know, where qu quantum supremacy would happen in that type of area, right? No surprises there. Uh, the first useful application might be in modeling some sort of molecular process, is what I'm hoping, like the Harbour Bosch or something like that. That'd be amazing if we could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's there yet. let's follow up the earlier question about uh, possible application in uh, decryptography yeah. or breaking uh, breaking encryption, because if that really were possible, it would be bad news for most things which are thought to be kept, which where most companies are expecting lots of their data to be kept secret and they may no longer may no, yeah. no longer be secret. Yeah. Why aren't more people worried about this? Why do people yeah. sort of say Ooh, and then yeah. move on to the next topic? No. Why, I mean, are, are there people in IBM and yes. Google who are seriously thinking about yeah. this, or are they all hoping it's not going to happen and just uh, uh, focusing on chemistry instead because it's right. Right, right. Good question, David. Yeah, no, everybody's incredibly worried about that, um, including IBM and Google, because you know what? The big banks are worried about it, and they're, they're paying customers. So yeah, they better be worried. And also, Google, they use encryption a lot, too. And so everybody's worried about it um, unanimously across the field. Now, there is a competition uh, created by NIST, the uh, National Institute for Standards and Technology in the United States, um, similar to NPL here. And, um, and NPL are working on this problem as well. They said, OK, um, we're going to create a competition to who can come up with the quantum algorithms uh, to combat qu um, quantum encryption hacking, right? And so that uh, competition is in progress. And a lot of algorithms and papers have been written. And very mathematical, though. You and I pr probably cannot do it because it really is deep quantum information theory at this point. But uh, the point is that a lot of papers, like hundreds at this point, have been written because of this competition started by NIST. Now, besides the NIST competition, you can guarantee Goldman Sachs uh, JP Morgan, HSBC, all the banks in the world uh, do have a team now and if they didn't they would have employed a few people working on this problem because 53 qubits is a scary moment, quantum supremacy is a scary f moment for them. Okay, so it's a real problem and people are taking it very seriously and if they can't solve it, uh, they're in big trouble. Yeah, I understand that uh, some people have said don't worry there are quantum safe algorithms but on the other hand, it's still a bit unclear because it's quite complex mathematics and other people yeah. might find clever ways, after all, to make these supposedly quantum-safe algorithms vulnerable, after all. Yes, indeed, David. Yeah, there's no guarantee. Absolutely right. Uh, what the guarantees that it will, we can say it will take, it'll take you a thousand years, just like with RSA, etc., to crack. Uh, this quantum algorithm or, or to quantum encryption, uh, unless you know that we double the number of qubits quicker than we expected, and it will only take a uh, hundred years. But so it's maybe a little, you know, one step, cops and Robert. You know, you always try to stay one step ahead. I don't think it will ever be a completely solved problem, just like classical encryption is never a completely solved problem. Yeah. Uh, in classical computing, uh, a clock cycle drives inputs through a series of shift registers yeah. to get the output. Yeah. What is the equivalent? with the qubits? <laughs> quantum register. <laughs> a quantum register. Yeah. Now the problem with quantum memory and quantum registers is that, as you saw, we're up to 53 qubits. We, we, we're not there. Uh, it's, a, it's an open problem. It's an outstanding problem. What we're doing to get around with it is solving problems that don't require a large amount, vast amounts of memory. Quantum memory. So that's where the co-processor co part comes in. If we do need a lot of memory, we, we're forced to force it back to the classical. And so the quantum can only do stuff that doesn't require a lot of memory. But in terms of your question, yeah, you use a quantum register. They do exist because they don't need a lot of qubits. Right. Yeah. Where are we on the Gartner hype curve with quantum yeah. computing? Cool. Peak? Peak hype? Peak? Right. Peak. Uh, and Machio Kiku 
uh, he, he felt that Shaw's algorithm was some years away from even being close to being kind of uh, resolved yes. with. No, that one is. That one, we need a million uh, clean qubits uh, to solve, to, to solve uh, Shaw's algorithm. So a million, and that's, that's error corrected. So if, yeah, uh, if and when topological uh, gets built, that will happen pretty quickly. There's, um, so I was at the National Quantum Computing Showcase yesterday at the QE2 Center. It's held once a year. David, I've been to the last three, and every year it gets bigger and better. And there are all the companies I showed, all the UK companies were there. Okay, it was brilliant, fantastic day. So I was talking to one guy uh, from Sussex, uh, Winifred Hensinger. So he started a company called Universal Quantum. Hasn't got a website yet. I keep bugging him to put one up. But he's just got a lot of EC. And um, great group, been working on it for 20 years, maybe a bit longer actually. And uh, he was saying that he, he's building a modular, he's, he's working on iron traps, which is a different technology than IBM and Google. Uh, at Sussex and Honeywell and Iron Cure are also working on Iron Trap. So it's, it's two camps basically the Iron Trap camp and the superconducting. Superconducting got there first, but the Iron Trap might catch up quicker and pass actually. And, and that's what I'm actually expecting. And um, so he's just raised a lot of money. Iron Cure just raised about 50 million or something. Honeywell's got big resources. Now he was saying that. They're actually, it's on their website, you can check it out. They have presentations and papers. They're building a modular system with 100 uh, qubits in, in each module. And because it's iron trap, you can't do this with superconducting. You can just connect them together like freaking Lego. And, that's, and if the, you can do that, you can get to a million pretty quick. Now, that's a huge claim. And I take my hat off to Winnie Fred for making these huge claims. But he's made it openly, publicly, and he, and if he's crazy, then you know he's he's a guy who might know more than we do, and so it might happen quite quickly. But I don't I don't like to say that because then I'm adding to the hype. You see, I don't I don't want to say anything like that. But I'm just saying it might you know iron traps might be a way forward. Microsoft at any point could just announce you know what we we've we've can build a topological computer. They just might. Right. The problem with the Gartner hype cycle is it sort of suggests that all technologies are going to go, go along exactly the same curve. Oh, in reality, yeah. some go through quite different curves. <laughs> and it's true. nice as an inter introduction talking point, but yeah. just like I think Ray Kurzweil's curve is too neat and simple, I also think the Gartner hype cycle is too neat and simple for some of the real world technologies. Yeah. And the real answer is we don't know where we are because we don't know whether there's a whole flood of disappointment ahead or there's some more interesting breakthroughs. By the way, I've seen lots of hands up. I'm trying to take people who haven't asked a question before. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, you talked a lot about the commercial organisations developing yeah. quantum. What about governments and yeah. military and yeah, good point. everybody so, else? Yeah, so with all new technologies, it always starts with the government because they're the ones with the money, right? They, they just do. They have more money than Google. Okay, simple fact. Um, and um, it's been happening in government all along, all along, in national labs. Okay, so our national lab in the UK is Harwell. Uh, MPL, things like that, and you know, they don't talk about it. Um, in the US, you know, there are many national labs, qu some quite well known, Los Alamos, um, you know, the usual suspects. Yes, they've been working on it harder than anybody all this time. And we don't quite know what they're doing. Yeah, what challenges are they working on? The same ones as Google and, and IBM, the same ones, you know, but we just don't quite That's know what they're doing. They're not going to tell us either. <laughs> Maybe we don't want to know. <laughs> so my question was actually, Along the same lines, can yeah. you maybe um, speculate on the potential implications in terms of privacy and right. uh, so given, let's say, Snowden's revelations, clearly there's a, a huge interest at the state level, not just in the US yeah. or Europe, but China, Everywhere. obviously. Um, and clearly, if we end up with a world where cryptography isn't necessarily as... Uh, Oh, yeah. as certain as it's been, yeah. then the implications are huge across the board. That's an option, yes. That's an option. The world we're going into is a different world than the world we're in now. Yeah, yeah, that's just an option. Yeah, yeah, so we have to put that on the table. Yeah. So basically, it's going to be scary and we don't know. Yeah. And we need to th spend more time thinking about it. Maybe I should have more uh, London Futurist events on quantum computing. Hi, um, two questions. First of all, um, what exactly is topological? Yeah. And uh, related to it, or, 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 or maybe not, I think you, you mentioned something. Um, I was going to ask a question about the potential massive parallelism yes. in quantum, yeah. you know, co connecting. Yeah. You know, even if we can't go much more than, than 53 
qubits, if we connect yeah. up all these, these right. quantum computers, I, isn't that potentially a way forward? Yeah. And the second question is, what about all the other computing considerations like data right. storage, energy yeah. requirements, you know, okay. how does quantum computing impact on yeah. that whole ecosystem of computing? Yeah, that's right. So energy-wise, they're like a thousand times more efficient than the big uh, classical data centers. So that's a plot. That's a win. That's a win, win, win. Uh, now, topological um, quantum computing involves, uh, so the quantum world has something called anions, which uh, are entangled particles and they form a geometrical topological braided structure. And this can only happen in the quantum world, not the classical world. Um, so what happens is I've, if I have eight qubits, then they can, and, and, I, and I'm clever with lasers, I can put them in a state called a topological quantum state or braided state, and they take uh, the qubits then uh, take on the characteristics of anions, these particles called anions or Maharana uh, anion particles, which is deep quantum field theory. It's been known, these, these, all of this has been known about for a while. It took a Fields medalist mathematician, Michael Friedman, 20 years ago to do the math, put the finishing touches on, but physicists knew uh, that you know all of these uh, properties are described by quantum mechanics. Uh, the, the quantum mechanics uh, come up with by Schrodinger and Dirac and Feynman, quantum field theory. Um, so Microsoft very, 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 very cleverly said, okay, we can make, because these things are braided and connected, uh, if you tap one, you tap the whole structure, not just a single one. So they're topologically, geometrically, mathematically uh, intertwined, but it also means physically as well. So that's a uh, genius, basically, of Microsoft to say that. Uh, the other thing is that Microsoft, I really do uh, take my hat off them because they knew it was going to take longer than any other technology, and yet they still put all their bets on it and all their money. So, so hats off to Microsoft. They're the ones doing that. And they, they probably will do it eventually. This is why they made the announcement um, last week when IBM said we're putting a 53 qubit. Because they don't have it, they could have had a superconducting. They have enough money to buy the physicists to build it. And the engineers, uh, they said, you know what, we, we don't have it, but we know people want quantum computing. Obviously, everyone does. And so um, we, we're just going to put all, all the uh, other guys on the cloud, on our cloud, on Azure, and wait till Topological comes along. But w once Topological comes along, everyone will just come to Microsoft and say, how much do I need to give you for Topological? And they'll just say, well, too bad. I mean, you, you sorry, you can't have it. We have it. Yeah. Why aren't some of the other big companies also investigating Topological computing? It's too hard. It's very hard, and it's very long term, and they don't have a deep pockets. Uh, one could argue IBM and Microsoft, uh, Google have deep pockets, but they wanted to get there. They just wanted something but, work. But it doesn't have to be either or. It can be no. the proposition of both, right? Sorry for the no. joke. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. there, there's no. not necessarily one paradigm. You know, no. if they get to the topological at the same time as good error correction mm -hmm. technologies also. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we saw on that curve, that's a good point. The error correction was also improving that T2 curve. Yeah, so that's a good point. But topological, which you won't need any quantum error correcting quantum qubit. So remember I said, um, so yeah, for a thousand, yeah, you just need a lot of uh, qubits do the error correcting, okay? So you need a lot more qubits to error correct. Whereas topological, you don't need, they're already error corrected, so you don't need any extra qubits. So every single qubit you have is actually a functional one, and it can do the computation. It doesn't have to be used on error correction. That's the, that's the power of topological. And Microsoft have put this bet on, right? They, they, they did hire the, bright, the best mathematician in the world, and, and you know, they have an amazing team of people. Um, and they've made up for it by saying, you know what, we can still make money, we'll just use other vendors and put them on our cloud, which mm -hmm. is brilliant, right? I mean, all the data and all the energy yeah. requirements for, yeah. for, those, for scaling. Scaling, energy. That's my, my, my second question. Energy is good. Energy is very good. Um, it, yeah, it, it's a thousand times less right now, but that will come down to probably 100x uh, less, thousand time, uh, 10,000 times less energy than the equivalent classical computer. Now it's about a thousand times uh, less energy for that quantum supremacy that Google used about a thousand times less energy than running that on a classical computer. But the thing is, to run it on a classical computer would have taken 100,000 years, so then it's a 10 to the 12 more energy. Yeah, it's, you can't, yeah. quantum's just different, yep. right? It's really? just a different... Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to ask about the ideology of the ecosystem, meaning as blockchain tried to create a crypto-anarchist yeah. world, 
and as the transhumanists try to create immortality? Yeah. What are the values, the philosophy, the ideologies that are permanent within the computer scientists that work within quantum computing? Yeah, the values are probably pretty transhumanist. Yeah, because, you know, they're forward thinkers, you know. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, I like to say we because I consider myself a physicist and also a transhumanist. Um, so yeah, I, ju I think we are super forward thinking and, and we're, we're for, for it, right? We're, we're for longer, healthier lifespans. Um, yeah, we're for clean energy. Well, Richard Feynman, who was mentioned earlier, he did also say roughly the same time that uh, there's nothing in biology that predetermines death and it's only a matter of time before we're going to find out how we can overcome this inconvenience. So that's uh, sort of his, uh, his approach to things. David Deutsch, who has written about this as well. Uh, as you mentioned, Peter, he's written a couple of excellent books, yeah, book. In Search of Infinity, or The Beginning of Infinity, yeah. uh, In Search of Reality and The Beginning of Infinity. Right. And in both these books, he's quite open-minded about exactly what humanity, if we are sufficiently rational, are going to be able to accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we'll merge, maybe we'll become a different type form of energy, maybe we'll travel on light beams to a different planet. I mean, the future's wide open. Right? That's how I like to think of it. I have one more question about uh, superconductors. Yep. Because, as we heard, a lot of the problems is keeping the temperature sufficiently low that this can work. But I saw one of the possible applications is high-energy superconductors. Yep. And if we can get quantum mechanics to help us to design, if we can get quantum computers to help us design better high-energy, high-temperature superconductors, right. is it then we could have a feedback cycle that suddenly we're going to have the ability to have quantum computing running at uh, room temperature yeah. instead? And that might uh, accelerate things even more. Because after all, yeah. the reason we've done so well with classical computers is we have been able to use classical computers to help us design yeah. better classical computers. And so maybe in yeah. the same way, quantum computing can lead on to better nanotechnology yeah. and high-energy super conductors. I agree totally 100% accurate David just as we use machine learning to uh, design classical computers running on classical computers uh, there we, we people are already using quantum computers to um, design and quantum machine learning to design um, more efficient and effective qubits so it's already happening it's a great point yep yeah bootstrapping yep. we're almost out of time but uh, we can take one or two more quick questions especially if people haven't asked one before so the guy at the back mentioned the singularity. Yeah. Do you think that the date has been brought forward by the recent developments? Uh, probably, yeah. I mean, it depends how you define the singularity. I'll get, I'll get, I'll use that get out clause. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But everything's accelerated. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're surprised to be here so early. Yes. And as long as we can keep going, uh, then, then yeah, I think everything will be accelerated. Yeah. So uh, when do you think we'll have a, a artificial general intelligence as good as humans? I know you've got another hat. You run some of the most interesting discussions on Facebook about artificial general intelligence, don't right. you? Yeah. And you don't yeah. take any nonsense there. So yeah. what's your... Are you bearing in mind all that you know about quantum computing and other things, I know you, you don't want to be too specific, but uh, if, we, if you were down the pub, what would date would you give for the likely yeah. uh, advent of artificial general intelligence? Yeah, I'd say uh, 2029. I think, yeah, Kurzweil was spot on. 2029? Yeah. I, d I do believe that, and once we get there, it'll shoot through, and we'll have super intelligence, and they will help us to speed up the whole, you know, discovery scientific process, not only in classical but also in quantum computing. So that's a great point. Because Kurzweil does pick out the date 2029 is when he thinks the Turing test can be passed, and he's yeah. famously got a long bet with, uh, is it a? One, one of the founders of one of the other software companies, yeah. the two of them got a long bet as to whether the Turing test really will be passed by 2029. But I think your point is that once this is possible, we won't expect the same rate of change anymore. We're going to see a faster rate of change. So I think Ray Kurzweil has a long time between passing the Turing test 2029 and what he calls the singularity 2045. Mm. I think if we get to the first, it won't take us so long to get to the second yep. because we'll have these positive feedback cycles. Yeah. And that's why we need to spend even more of our time today thinking ahead, just in case actually this would be a mistake. Mm. Right. Any final comments? I'll just say, could I just quickly ask a question, but before that, you, you, yeah, just pick up on the biological theme. Uh, I think it's a separate subject, right? Um, biology does use quantum, you know, birds use it to navigate, plants use it to photosynthesize. 
Um, these are quantum mechanical processes. The thing about the temperature, how that's related, is that iron traps don't need to be cooled to, they, they run at room temperature. That, uh, that's the other thing, right? Superconductor needs a cooling. So these different systems uh, use different uh, temperatures. Yeah, topological is room temperature as well, I think. So, uh, but I don't want to just make this direct connection between biology and quantum computing because it's not what I've been talking about the whole time is it hasn't been about biological quantum computing. It's been about qubits. See, a bird's brain is wet and squishy. A plant is room temperature and squishy. Yeah, so, so what is really a separate subject. But biology does use quantum physics. It totally does, yeah. But I've been talking about, you know, classical quantum physics, not biological quantum computing. Yeah. I, I think that leads nicely on to... Um, with the natural world, what yeah. does this all mean for humanity? Because people are, some folks are applauding the singularity. Mm. And I work in consultancy, and I see a lot of fear <coughs> amongst people about what does, what's going to happen to my future. And this is basically an automation, that I, basic automation that I bring into the workplace. Yeah. And I see this such a lot, it's affecting people, and we have to deal with the marketing hype that comes out that it, this is going to take all your jobs, and people are worried about their livelihood. Of Just course. thought, how do you, how how would how would one yeah. address this in a positive way, yeah, giving an yeah. optimistic view for the future for people, work, and uh, humanity? I think um, uh, so. So. I mean, I, I think I know the answer, but I wouldn't put it quite this way. I, I mean, I'm so happy there'll be no more freaking work, so I can get on and do stuff I like, right? I hate work. Work, by definition, is be a slave. Sit in a factory, sit in a white cot. I don't like it. I hate work. Yay. <laughs> After the film 2001 came out, Arthur C. Clarke was asked about it, and he said maybe he would have stressed things a bit differently. He said the goal of a all this technology is so that we will have full unemployment, yeah. so we'll all have yeah. plenty of time to play. Yeah. And maybe the word play is a bit too playful because we will be actually doing serious stuff, but it'll be stuff that uh, we truly want to do, yeah. rather than being stuck in what various people call bullshit jobs, or uh, jobs which in various ways are back-breaking or soul-destroying. Yeah. I know that's not exactly what some of the main big companies want to hear because they want to be able to tell their employees, yeah, you're gonna have lots of work with us in the future, but maybe a better answer is that we should be campaigning to get society to restructure into some kind of citizens' uh, in income, citizens' dividend, so that more and more people will benefit from the fruits of the very powerful technological companies without them all needing to work for these technological companies. Mm. And that's a bigger topic than we can address in the last few minutes of this meeting, but I encourage you to come to the pub where we'll be discussing that more. I'm going to wind up in a minute. I'm going to ask you in a minute to uh, thank uh, Peter. I'll just say a few things about what's coming next. In three weeks, we are turning back to the subject a bit. We've got a professor from Oxford called Sonia Contera, who is one of the leading thinkers about nanotechnology from Oxford. And she's going to be talking about some of the themes from her new book, Nano Comes to Life. And as we know, nanotechnology is quite closely linked with quantum computing, although they're not exactly the same thing. So I encourage you to come and listen to that. There are other meetings advertised online, including something different we're doing tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. Don't worry, we're not asking you to come to Birkbeck College at 9 o'clock, but there's going to be an online discussion about some of the themes about how politics might need to change in the light of some of these uh, ruptures that are coming along. That uh, politicians shouldn't just be thinking about going back to how it used to be in the good old days of the 1970s or the 1950s or the 1730s, depending on which politician is speaking, but we should be embracing the possibility of a very different future. How do we get there? So that's going to be an online conference with Zoom uh, at 9 o'clock tomorrow night, Sunday. Uh, as one possibility. And the final thing I'll tell you about the future is that uh, some of us will be taking a short walk after this meeting to a nearby pub where we can talk about all aspects of the future, whether it's the quantum mechanical, quantum uh, computational aspects, or is the brain really a quantum machine, or lots of other things. So I'll put up the slides about these future meetings and the route to the pub in a moment. But before I do that, let's uh, give uh, Peter a warm thanks for his fascinating <laughs> talk. <laughs>